Hi, my name is Fadi Manso. I'm an EP at Shum and I'm going to do the arrhythmia part for you, of course. We're going to start by the most frequent arrhythmia, the AF post-op. The frequency varies from 15% after a single cabbage to 60% when the surgeries are more complicated. It peaks at two to four days. The risk factors on the echo atrial dilatation, but do not forget to look at diastolic dysfunction. It is a powerful predictor. EF is another predictor in valvular disease. In surgery, the cardiopulmonary bypass time is also a predictor of AF. What seems to be protective of, doing, of not doing AF? An off-pump surgery, the preservation of the anterior fat pad, medication given before and after the surgery, so perioperative beta blockers, which is the most popular because of their safety profile. Amiodarone is another choice, but it has more side effects. The other antiarrhythmics are less used because of their safety profile. There's data but that seems to be less useful on magnesium, calcium blockers, overdrive pacing, digoxin, ACE, statins, so it's not regularly used. There are ongoing studies for the posterior pericardial drainage to, re to reduce AF or Botox in the anterior fat pad. When you have AF after a heart surgery, the questions that you ask yourself, should we keep the patient in sinus or should we just control the ventricular rate? There was a study looking at that and if you had a rate rate versus rhythm control strategy, there was no difference. The length of hospitalization was the same and the re-hospitalization at two months were the same. 85% of, of the patients were in sinus at discharge and 95% were in sinus at two months, whatever the strategy you used. There was a lot of side effects from an amniotaron. The conclusion of the study is to start with rate control and only use amiodarone if rate control is difficult. You have a fast AF that you can slow down, the blood pressure is not too high, so it would be reasonable to try to put back the patient in sinus. Anticoagulation is always a hard question. The guidelines are not very helpful. They say to treat eight to six weeks minimum after to treat if the AF is more than 80, 48 hours. Coumadin is considered the gold standard, but no act or acceptance. You should wait three days post-op to be sure that the patient is not going to bleed, especially if there's a pericardial effusion. We look at the patient six to 12 weeks after discharge, EKG, halter, we find 2-5% to of AF in which we continue the treatment. If there's no AF, then we have a decision to take. Should we prolong the monitoring or should we stop there? And it depends on the chat score of the patient, the number of extra beats on the halter, and the echo parameters. There are recent studies that shows that more you look for AF, more you're going to find it. So if studies using a loop recorder or a patch shows that you can find 20% of AF at 30 days post-op. So maybe we should be looking for longer. We know that post-op AF is a risk of stroke, and it seems to be a but it seems to be lesser than native native valve AF. The things that we can say we can say that it's benign. We have studies showing that. When you compare a patient that had post-op AF compared with a patient without AF, the patient with AF is going to have a much higher risk of adverse effect on the follow-up. It's easy to look at the AF post-op on the EKG. Sometimes you have to pay special attention. Sometimes you're going to have a complete heart block. Conjunctional rhythm, 
it seems to be regular. It is regular. But if you look at the atrial baseline, you see that there's no sinus rhythm. It is AF. We're going to talk about the maze surgery you can do for patients with pre-existent AF. There's no studies against EP ablation. The data in surgery is very, very heterogeneous. The patients are older, sicker, the, the AF is longer lasting. The, because of the valve surgeries, the atriomas are very dilated norms most of the time. If you look at the worst cases in the mitral valves, the success rate is 50% at one year. In the aortic valves where the atrium is a bit better, the, it's 80 to 90% of sinus rhythm at one year after a maze procedure. The only limit of those numbers is that AF is not aggressively researched after. Some studies show that the maze could have morbidity mortality, but most studies show that it seems to be safe, but there is a higher pacemaker amputation after a maze procedure. Quality of life seems to be increased. EF seems to be higher. The survival rates are debatable to show if it does a benefit in survival because you did a maze. The STS is going to give it a class one indication to do a maze during surgery. CCS will say to consider it. The approaches is different between EPs and surgeons. Surgeon will do the isolations of the pulmonary veins, but they will add lines in the left atrium. And the best results are shown when you do more lines and you do both atrium, the right and the left one. In EP, we try to do just the veins because our data shows that if we start doing too many lines, then we create macro reentries arrhythmias. So we do, we create other arrhythmias. When we do it, we pass by the vein, we go to transemptal, then we isolate the pulmonary veins using heat or cold. Our success rate in perfect patients that are less sick than your patients is 70% after two procedures. We especially do it for quality of life, but there's more data coming that there is a survival benefit, especially in patients with LV dysfunction. There are reports of hybrid procedure between EPs and surgeons, but it's not very popular, to be honest. The left atrium appendage exclusion is a class 2A indication with the maze. There's different techniques. The stapling seems to show the worst result. Most studies say that there's no significant morbidity and mortality because of the surgery. There's no long prospective studies to show if we can stop the anticoagulation after. So when we want to stop the anticoagulation, what we do normally is we do a transesophageal echo to be sure that the appendage has been completely excluded because in 20% of the cases, there's still something left. Post-operative arrhythmia, if you continue, we're going to pass to the ventricular arrhythmia. If you look at the extrasystole, the ventricular extrasystole and the non-sustained VT, they have a prognostic factor only in patients with low EF. If we're going to pass for those patients, we're going to look at the, try to find a reversible cause and beta block the patients. Sometimes we're going to give amidaron, but most of the time we won't because there is no study that shows a change in mortality of amidaron in those patients. The EP study for those cases are usually not done because of the lack of data. If the patient has a VT post-op, it's not a frequent thing. It's less of 1% of the patients. It is associated with ventricular dysfunction, and then we have to rule out normally acute graft closure, especially if you have polymorphic VT. And the first 
48 hours of a procedure. So it seems to be secondary in those cases, and normally we treat this here. If it's monomorphic VT, then we will probably talk about scar-related VT, and we are going to be inclined to put an ICD. Sometimes you have gray zones, the patient does the monomorphic BT in like the first 24 hours or a polymorphic BT a bit later on. Then do you use an ICD vest to protect the patient in the first months after surgeries? The studies for us in cardiology are negative for the ICD vest. It's not easy to get in Montreal. Do you do an EP study? Sometimes that's what we're going to do if we don't know what to do, what decision to make. Another case is if the VT is happening happened before the surgery, could you say we revascularize the patient so we don't need to put an ICD? We consider those patients secondary prevention patients. So a patient that has a monomorphic VT before revascularization, we don't look at the EF. We don't look at the fact that the patient has been revascularized, and we do suggest the patient to have an ICD because we consider it scar related. If the VT is polymorphic, then we say, okay, we revascularize the patient, it's probably ischemic, and we won't put an ICD. The patient who have ICDs in primary prevention now. So you ask us for a consult saying, we operated this patient. Before surgery, the EF was 20-25%. Should we put an ICD before the patient leaves the hospital? We will wait three months for optimized heart failure medication. And our guidelines ask us to wait three months after revascularization. Because there is a study, cabbage patch, that has been done that shows that if you go too fast after cabbage with an ICD, there's no benefits in mortality. So not only we're gonna optimize those patients, the pills, we're gonna reevaluate the patient three months after the surgery and decide then if we have to put an ICD in. What about the CRT to resynchronize the patient? If we have to put a device in, we're gonna think about the CRT if there's a left bundle branch block or if the patient is paced because the pace rhythm is the equivalent a bit of a left mental branch block. The point of this is to recognize the patient, so to augment the quality of life, reduce mortality, reduce heart failure hospitalization. We're going to target the CS, then look for a lateral vein, and we're going to go put the lead inside. So we're going to try to be basal and posterior to have the maximum benefits of resynchronization. If the lead finishes anterior or apical, the resynchronization is less good. And in the case that we fail or that we don't like the position of the lead, which is about 5% of our cases, we will ask the surgeon to try to put an epicardial lead on the left ventricle. And again, we're going to ask you guys to be basal and lateral. The freedom from complication of a kind of surgery is 90% acutely and 80% long term. There is no data comparing the epicardial versus the transvenous. So if you go to put one, we will ask you again to be basal and posterior. So an interested surgeon is important. Sometimes if we see the patient, if we have the chance in arrhythmia to see the patient before, and we see that the patient has a low EF and a left bundle branch block, sometimes we're going to ask you, please, can you put an epicardial lead, tunnel the lead in the pectoral region? So when we're going to think about putting our devices later, the lead is going to be there and we can connect it to our device because it is the hardest lead for us to implant. It is a class to be indication to uh, do that. Now, if we talk about pacing post-surgery, the incidence varies a lot. Talking about needing a pacemaker after a heart surgery, 1% if it's a cabbage, 6% for a valve, 
and 11% in more complicated cases. If the bypass time is high, if the aortic valve is calcified, large prosthesis, and the colditis, this is all factors that pushes to a pacemaker. From our point of view, if we look at the EKG after, after before the surgery and see that there's a pre-existing conduction disease and the patient comes out in surgery in a heart block, we will go faster with the pacemaker. Most, the, the funny thing is that most studies do not call, correlate, correlate the long-term dependency on the speed we put the pacemaker in. Meaning that if you put the pacemaker in the first two days or in the seven day, after the seven days, if you follow those patients, it doesn't correlate with the need to have a pacemaker, which is a bit funny. 10%, only 10% of patients do not need, do really not, do not need the pacemaker after the, the, after the surgery at one month. And 30 to 40% are not dependent on the pacemaker at one month. So experts recommend five to seven days of waiting if the hypercardial needs are okay. Again, this is just a consensus, consensual guideline. We go faster if the patient is dependent for more than 84, 80, 48 hours. And we're gonna wait a bit more if the block is on and off or there's a narrow escape rhythm. We think that the patient then could recuperate and we're gonna have a tendency to wait especially if the pericardial leads are okay. Pacemakers are not complication-free. We have a high risk of complication. 8% in the pacemaker group at one day, at 40 days, of major complications, and 10% in the ICD group at one month. CRT and not grades, it's even more than that. The weak length of our system is the lead. The lead moves, the lead spreads. To try to avoid the problem with the leads, a new system has been developed, like the lead list. The lead, it's, for now, there's one company, the Medtronic, that does the Micra. It's a small capsule that you inject in the heart. You use a 27 French femoral venous axis, and you deliver that thing in the heart. It's not small, it's still big, but there's no leads. We try to think about that when the patient is high risk of infection because this system seems to get less infected. And when the subclavian axis is a challenge or precious like in a dialysis patient. Because of the absence of lead, the complication rate long-term seems to be lower, but short-term when you put that device in, we have most vascular complications because of the sheet or perforation because of the size of the micra. When it perforates, it's not good, and one time of two out of two, they go, or they can, be, they need an intervention and finish and can finish in surgery. The um, the percentage of complication for tamponade varies with the patient, it's around two, three percent, but can be as high as 10 percent in sicker patients. In the ICD, there's the sub-Q ICD that tries to get rid of the endovenous lead. So the sub-Q ICD is really under the skin. We do not have a lead that goes into the heart, so there's no lead stress and fracture no endocarditis, no tricuspid valve damage, and no tamponade. What you need to know for the surgeon, it is a shock box, so you cannot use it as a pacemaker, and the lead goes over the sternum, so if you cut, it's nice to know that there's a lead there. We think about this machine when the person obviously do not have any vascular access or it's precious because it's under the skin or when the patient has a higher infection risk because it's not touching the heart.
you cannot use this system when you have to do use it as you need a pacemaker or you need to resynchronize the patient. When you talk about leads, you talk about extraction, and also tracking the leads. The class one indication is infection. You cannot treat an infection with antibiotics because it's metal, it's not going to penetrate the leads, and the risk is developing an endocarditis. So that's why we never, we should never wait too long because if it stays to the lead fine, then it goes into the bloodstream, attaches to the valves, and then you're into trouble. Other indication for extraction, debulking. If you have more than five leads, we do not like it. And then we start removing those. If you need vascular access to add leads to do an upgrade and it's completely blocked and you don't want to go on the other side and add more leads, you can use an extractor. Extracting a lead will give you access to the vascular system and you can add through the sheet new leads. Extraction could be easy in the first year, but after the first year, it becomes challenging, especially after five to 10 years. Renal failure patients are harder. Passive leads are harder. When there's two coils in an ICD lead, it's also harder because of the adherences. When it add, when you, the lead goes, add, it becomes adherent to the SVC, it's not good. It's a fragile structure, so if you pull on it, you can rip the SBC, and this is not going to end well. Other point is in the apex of the right ventricle. We have mechanical, mechanical tools to help us. So we have a gun with a razor blade here that cuts the fibrous tissue, and we have a laser system to cut also with the laser the fibrous tissue. If we cannot have access to the lead because it breaks, we have to go with a snap using a femoral station. Normally, we have the patient in a hybrid room with surgical draping. The surgeon doesn't need to be in the room, but he needs to be aware of the case because if there's a complication, you should have a surgical backup in five, the next five minutes. Perforation has a very high mortality rate. The way that the surgeon is going to intervene is going to depend where you perforate. If you perforate on the SVC versus on the apex, maybe the approach of the surgeon will not be the same. I'm going to pass to pacemaker troubleshooting now. So this is going to be classical cases. This is going to be a case of ventricular undersensing. As you can see, there's too many spikes on this is EKG. And pacemaker should sense the QRS, inhibit itself, and where's the, when there's an absence of the QRS, it should deliver a pacemaker spike and capture the heart. Here you see two, it doesn't see the QRS and there's too many spikes. There's no loss of capture because you're not supposed to capture when you fall in the QRS on T wave. So you have to play with the sensitivity. Contrarily, if you don't have enough spikes on your EKG, it's because you have oversensing. The pacemaker is seeing things that aren't there. It's seeing noise, it thinks it's a QRS, and stops working. It inhibits itself. So again, you have to play with the sensitivity. Every QRS is different and has its own amplitude. So let's say that this one is around 2.5. If you program the sensitivity at five millivolts, so it's not very sensitive, you're gonna hide your QRS, you won't see it, and the pacemaker will just pace through the QRS without seeing it, and you're gonna have under sensing. If you program the sensitivity too high, which means a low value, then you're going to see too many things. You're going to see your QRS, that's going to be fine, but you're going to see your T wave. So the pacemaker is going to double count and you're going to have less spikes in, on your electrode 
So the sensitivity has to be programmed between 1.25 and 2.5. This is a classic case of loss of capture. The pacemaker senses well, but when it delivers a spike, it doesn't capture. Again, this is not a loss of capture. This one is because the, it falls into the QRS. You could suspect maybe that it senses bad, but when it's close to the beginning of the QRS, sometimes there's a competition between the pacemaker and the rate of the patient. But this is clearly a case of loss of capture. If it's an epicardial bead and you have two leads on the epicardium, then you can try switching leads and using bipolar versus unipolar configurations. The question that is asked sometimes is why is the pacemaker going fast? If you have a single chamber pacemaker, when a pacemaker that has one lead is going fast, it's because of the accelerometer. Every pacemaker, you can program the sensor function. So when the patient is going to move, it's going to be shaken. At that moment, the pacemaker is going to go faster. And that's the only reason a single chamber pacemaker can go fast. So VVVR6150 here. When you have a double chamber pacemaker, so you have an atrial bead, the most frequent reason that the pacemaker is going fast, it's because it's following the signal of the atrium to go fast. We have a patient that is sinus tachycardia. The job of the atrial lead is saying, hey, my patient is going fast, ventricularly, please follow me fast. So it's just gonna follow the sinus tachycardia of the patient. This is not the fault of the pacemaker. Sometimes though, you can have AF, and when you have pacemaker with AF, and the pacemaker doesn't see that the patient is in AF because the signal is too small, it's gonna try to follow the signals of the atrium and it's going to track fast. If it happens for a few seconds, it's fine, but if it happens for a long time, it's a problem. Normally, the pacemaker has an algorithm to prevent that. When it sees that the atrium is going fast, it does a mode switch. It says, fine, my atrium is going at 200. I do not want to go to 200, 300. I'm going to forget about the atrium and pace in a VVI mode, ignoring the atrium. But for that, the pacemaker must be able to sense well the signals in the atrium. Another reason that the pacemaker can go fast is if you have a pacemaker-mediated tachycardia, a PMT. Classically, it starts by a PVC. You have a retrograde P waves and then the pacemaker is going to try to follow this retrograde P wave. So retrograde P wave, spike, retrograde P wave, spike, and you're in a loop. If you're not sure what's happening, you can put a magnet. If you put a magnet on pacemaker, it's going to stop sensing this retrograde P waves, and the loop is going to stop. So if we talk about magnets, what happens when you put a magnet on a device? If you put a magnet on a pacemaker, the, there's going to be a loss of the sensing function, and the pacemaker is going to pace uh, in an asynchronous way. So it will ignore the QRSs of the patient and just pace. If a patient is dependent on the pacemaker and you're using an electrocutter, it's very useful because then the patient will go into a system. The pacemaker rate normally when you put a magnet is between 85 and 100. We avoid it if the patient has an impressive rhythm because then you're going to compete with the QRS of the patient. It won't detect them because of the magnet and it's going to pace in the T wave and everywhere. If you have an ICD and you put a magnet, there will be no effect on the pacing function, which means if you have a dependent patient and you put a magnet on the ICD, the patient can go into a systole if it detects the electrocutter. It will deactivate the VTVF function while the magnet is on the defibrillator. 
So when the patient is not dependent on the pacemaker function, we put a magnet on the defib and it inhibits the detection of the arrhythmia. You do not need to reinterrogate the device after a magnet has been put on a pacemaker nor on an ICD. The only reason to reinterrogate a device is if the patient had an external shock with pads and you think that the vector went through the pacemaker, it could reset the pacemaker. So we like to interrogate it after to be sure that that didn't happen. So in conclusion, if we talk about AF, post-cam, post-op, think about rate control first. If you can't, rhythm control with another round of shocks. The guidelines for anticoagulation are not very clear. We know that there's a less risk of stroke, but the risk of stroke is still not benign. So it has to be considered and the patient has to be followed and anticoagulated if the AF stays. Maze and LAA exclusion. The data is interesting. This, the number seems good, but the population is heterogeneous and we don't look aggressively for AF. If after an LAA exclusion you want to stop anticoagulation, do a TEE, so a transosal echography, before to be sure that the LAA is well excluded. If we talked about ventricular extra beats or non sustained VTs, we think about beta blockers. Amiodarone normally is not given because of the lack of data. If the patient has a VT post-op, monomorphic after 48 hours, we do put for sure an ICD. Polymorphic in the first 48 hours, we rule out ischemia, we don't do an ICD. And in gray zones, sometimes we try to help ourselves with an EP study. If the patient had the VT before the surgery, an ICD is still indicated after the surgery if the VT was monomorphic. In our devices, the leads are the weak link of the pacing and ICD system. When you look at an EKG, if there's too many spikes, think about undersensing and you have to put the sensitivity higher so the number lower. If there's not enough spikes on the EKG, think about oversensing and reduce the sensitivity of the pacemaker. If you have a double chamber pacemaker going too fast, most of the time it's following the atrium because of sinus stack. Sometimes it's AF that is or flutter that is tracked or a PMT. Thank you very much. It concludes the